What a great song that is. Huh? In the context of uh, this uh, topic of why does God allow us suffering, we have a great and mighty God. Sadly, pain and suffering is part of living. No one is exempt from these experiences in our lives. The questions asked uh, verbally or internally by most people or many people most days. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. The struggles, problems we go through at this time are small. I guess that's the context I'd like us to share today. Will you join with me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, give us the opportunity to open our hearts to hear your word today. Your word says much about this uh, topic of suffering and pain. I pray, Lord, that your spirit will teach us things that, uh, or remind us of things that we already knew so that we might again rejoice with our hearts and with our voices that great is our God. Amen. And James also says in James 1, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of any kind. Now, that doesn't fit naturally with me. Consider it a pure joy. I guess in the context of what the scripture says about our lives and the way God wants us to live our lives. It is this intimate dependency upon him. And what Paul is saying, no matter how, in what he's saying in 2 Corinthians there, no matter how big our present troubles are, and I know many of you, and I know that through your lives there's been some major, major troubles and pain. But in the context of what is before us in our faith journey, in our hope, they become smaller. Why does God allow suffering? I used to think that question was an unfair question or a bad question. But over time, I've changed my mind. I know there's two ways, there's probably many ways to ask that question, but the two ways that come to mind so easily is, firstly, is asking the question this way. Why does God allow suffering? A very negative way and a blaming way of, of maybe uh, making that, uh, asking that question. The other way of asking this question is, why does God allow suffering? And I believe that the question can be an opportunity that challenges you and me to consider and discover God's big picture for our lives, even though at the time I might not understand what is going on. I'm going to just share two, I guess, uh, thoughts to start with as we go through this process today, this, this message today. Firstly, my belief or our belief, what your belief is, what my belief is. And uh, belief is, um, as I would often describe it as, a belief system is how I see myself, how I think you see me, and then how I see or interpret the world around me. So they're our beliefs, the things that have shaped our opinions and our biases, uh, our attitude. Um, and James says in James 1 that uh, even the demons believe and tremble. So belief is is our thought process, but it's quite different to faith. So my faith, your faith. Faith is a massive step further on from belief. And the best way for me to describe faith is just uh, from the words of Hebrew 11. Now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And James 1, again, also talks about the testing of your faith that produces perseverance. And I think that's one of the things that over and over again come out in Scripture and, and a lot of the commentators I was reading 
was that the whole dynamic of our struggle and our, our pain and uh, the, the difficult things in this world that we go through is about our endurance and our perseverance, our moving through these things, not alone, but with each other, but more specifically with God. And I think this sort of question also challenges me in how much I take on of Scripture as being my truth. And the, and the psalmist's words come to my mind, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Is God's word that in our lives? Is God's word uh, the clarity of giving us understanding on how we journey each step of the way and, and a guidance into our future? John Piper, as some of you have heard me preach before, I like John Piper and often what he says. And he, he talks about suffering as micro-suffering and macro-suffering. Micro-suffering is the, why does this happen to me? Why at this time? Why in this particular way? Why is it not coming to an end? So the, the micro is a very personal way of looking at our struggles and our pain and our suffering. And, uh, and, and Piper says, in that intentional, specific way, there's not a lot of answers in Scripture regarding Graham Jones, your suffering is because of. And that's how, I guess, micro is looking at it. But from macro perspective, macro suffering, the Bible is quite clear. And I agree, there is a lot of, to say about um, the, the dynamic of suffering and the dynamic of pain. And, and so, probably all the books of the Scripture, we read of accounts of how uh, we are to deal with and handle and grow through those times of our lives. I'll return to that thought shortly. So in asking the question, why does God allow suffering? For me, I had to go in the process of let's consider um, God. Because if we're going to either blame God for the suffering or if we're going to ask God for understanding and wisdom from the suffering, then we need to understand the nature of God. And this is going to be a, just a small window in, in this message because otherwise I could spend the whole time talking about this. So I'll try to follow my notes very clearly. The nature of God. Firstly, we have a, a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, that's shown to us in the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Secondly, God is eternal. God had no beginning and has no end. In Revelation 1, we read, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And then we go into the omni words of God. This Latin word uh, talks about all, the all. God is omnipotent. God is therefore all-powerful. In Matthew 19, Jesus says to his disciples, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. God is omnibenevolent. He is all-loving. In John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Then he goes on, For God did not son, send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This benevolent, all-loving God. God is omniscient. He knows everything. These ones always make me a bit uncomfortable. Yeah? Psalm 139, Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Then Hebrews 4, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And with all that knowledge that he has about you and me, he still unconditionally loves us. God is omnipresent. He is not limited by time or space. In Colossians 1, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. 
And finally, but not completely, God is transcendent, not limited by laws like, like we are in man, as mankind. In Isaiah 53, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. So this, this understanding that we have from Scripture of God, God's nature, is such an important influence. It should be an influence upon the way we understand the question of suffering within the world. Some of you might have, uh, probably many of you, maybe learnt like I did as a child, uh, the grace that said, um, God is great, God is good, let him thank us, thank him for our food. That whole concept, that, that simple dynamic of God's greatness and God's goodness permeates this world in spite of what goes on in this world, the horrible things in this world. Proverbs says in 23, As for a man or a woman, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. As a person thinks in their heart, so are they. I learnt this um, word expressed by um, Ralph uh, Waldo Emerson probably some 40, 45 years ago. And it stayed with me. And it's good, good thoughts. So a thought, we reap an action. So an action, we reap a habit. So a habit, we reap a character, and so a character, we reap a destiny. The path of our destiny from those thoughts is based on our thoughts. So the path of my destiny is based on my thoughts. My question then is, for you and for me, what influences our thoughts? What are the things that impact our thinking? What are the things that shape us in our lives that develop an action, a habit, a character and a destiny? The psalmist says, 119, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And we know that, I guess, the account of Jesus, when he was tempted, he, he responded to Satan with Scripture. It is so important that we know and understand and live out the Word of God. And it's easy to do that in the easy times. It becomes harder in the tough times, the struggle times. What we think about God is the most important thoughts we can ever have. What we think about God are the most important thoughts we can ever have. A God, to know God's nature, we can't but be in awe of him and drawn to him. I'm going to paraphrase a bit a, uh, an account in Genesis 18. And this interaction between Abraham and God was in regards to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, we read, firstly, just the verse in Genesis 18 from verse 23. Abraham said to God, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you spare the city? And God said, I'll spare the city with 50 righteous people. And for those who aren't aware of the story, then... Abraham didn't sort of, uh, he was like a dog with a bone. He didn't let go of that. He decided he would go five less. So he said to God, well, what if there's 45 righteous people in the city? Will you spare the city? God said, yes. What about 40? God said, yes. Then I think he pushed his luck a bit further than I probably would have with God. He said, what about God? What if there's 30 righteous people in the city of Sodom? And uh, he said, yeah, I'll, I'll save the city. One more step. What about 20? And God said, yes, I'll save the city. And he really was, I think, out on a limb by this time. And Abraham then said, what about if there were 10 righteous people in the city? Will you save the city? 
And God said, yes. And then we read in verse 25b of Genesis 18. This is Abraham speaking. Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? I'm glad I'm not the judge of all the earth because I wouldn't be able to do what is right. But God, this was the words coming out of Abraham towards God, that he knew God well enough to know he'd do what is right. God is not removed from us. He is personal. He's intimate. He came to us in the form of Jesus. And Paul in Romans 8 talks about, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And in that passage in Romans 8, the heading of that section is um, present suffering and future glory. And based on verse 18 of Romans 8, it says, I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. But isn't it true that sometimes our suffering and our pain and our lives or those that we love and those we care for causes someone to lose sight of what is down the track, the glory that is ahead. But God knows us. That's part of God's nature. He knows us. He knows our struggles. And he wants us just to hang in there at times. Professor Peter Bergen, a sociologist and a theologian, um, and he is best known for his works on the sociology of knowledge, and that is basically understanding how humans experience everyday reality. And he made this statement, this sentence. All people and cultures long to bestow meaning on the experience of suffering and evil. All people and cultures long to bestow meaning on the experience of suffering and evil. And Tim Keller goes on to talk about that statement. This is what Tim Keller says, and it's up on the screen. I've been arguing that no culture or worldview has ever done this with the thoroughness of Christianity. According to Christian theology, suffering is not meaningless, neither in general nor in particular instances. For God has purpose to defeat evil so exhaustively on the cross that all the ravages of evil will someday be undone and we, despite participating in it so deeply, will be saved." God is accomplishing this not in spite of suffering, agony and loss, but through it. It is through the suffering of God that the suffering of mankind will eventually be overcome and undone. While it is impossible not to wonder whether God could have done all this some other way without allowing all the misery and grief, the cross assures us that whatever the unfathomable counsels and purposes behind the course of history that are motivated by love for us and absolute commitment for our joy and glory. That is a powerful statement um, that uh, Tim Keller has made, and I think it's so true. See, our suffering and pain varies from individual to individual in our lives, For some, death of someone we love that was close to us. Or significant relationships that have broken down in our lives. Chronic illnesses. Abuse as a child or as a teenager or as an adult. Losing our house or our business or financial loss. Experiences of bullying, of fear, of anxiety, depression, loneliness, insecurity. Failures, suffering caused by natural disasters. And we go on and on. I mean, just the natural disasters of the floods these last few days. You know, our suffering and our pain is, is rampant in so many ways in our lives continually. Whatever your loss or pain is, I pray that what I'm sharing will not come across as insensitive or shallow or dismissive. 
Rather, the Spirit of God will touch our hearts and reveal his truth, his love, and his hope to each one of us. Let me come back just to the micro suffering and then talk about the macro. Why has this happened to me? Why at this time, you know, why, uh, what benefit can it be to my life? And the Bible doesn't, as I said, specifically answer those, that question individually. But what it does say, and this can be taken very personally as well, in Romans 5, these words, which I love these words in Romans 5, 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace, in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our suffering. Because we know suffering produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has, given, who has been given to us. So suffering is at the very heart of the Christian faith. Is not only the way Christ became like and redeemed us, but it is one of the main ways we become like him and experience his redemption. Let me repeat that. So suffering is at the very heart of the Christian faith. It is not only the way Christ became like and redeemed us, it is, but it is one of the main ways we become like him and experience his redemption. Therefore, our struggle produces a response. Either we overcome or we are overwhelmed. If we choose to overcome, we develop endurance. Our endurance develops character, godly character. Things like the fruit of the Spirit that we preached on last year. And our character produces hope. And this hope shines the light of God's glory in and through our lives. I'm not suggesting that in our pain and suffering we can't be upset or distressed. No, far from it. That we can't ask the question, why is this happening to me or to those that I love? Or even that we can't experience deep heartache and loss and sadness. What I believe God is saying, though, is draw nearer into me through it. Matthew 11, the verse that many of us know. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. In our personal suffering and pain, God totally understands all that we're going through, and he does deeply care. Sometimes, though, God chooses not to remove the afflictions we're going through. And I guess Paul is the prime example of that in Scripture, isn't he? Apart from Christ. 2 Corinthians 12. Three times I, that is Paul, pleaded with the Lord to take it away from him. But he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Isn't that amazing? That in spite of the, um, the thorn in the flesh that was talked about here in 2 Corinthians with Paul, and he cried out for it taken away, and God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul accepted that answer, and therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. Yeah, there's a model for us to be challenged by, isn't there? Paul the sufferer, Christ all efficient in his weaknesses. Let's look at macro suffering. What encouragement uh, does the Bible give us in our suffering? And there's three aspects I want to look at. There's many, but there's three I want to just identify uh, to you right now. Firstly, our reliance. 
Suffering is an opportunity to trust God and not the life-sustaining props of this world. 2 Corinthians 1. We were under great pressure, Paul says, far beyond our ability to endure. And sometimes I'm sure you and I feel that. So that we despair of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened, that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Secondly, reward. The Bible talks about reward. Suffering is working for us a great reward in heaven that will make up for the very loss here many times over. Again in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us eternal glory. That for far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And thirdly, a reminder. Suffering reminds us that God sent his son into the world to suffer so that our suffering would not be um, God's condemnation, but his purification. And in Philippians 3, verse 10, I want to know Christ, yes, the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. And Paul said in Acts, oh, sorry, yeah, Paul said in Acts 20, in everything I did, I showed that you that by this kind of hard work we must help the weak, remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than receive. And I, how I understand that is that there's times in my life and your life where we're receivers, we're in our struggles and pain, people get beside us, people who love us, people, family, friends, and there's other times in our lives that we might be the givers, where people who are struggling, we make ourselves available, we become present, we seek to encourage, we want to serve them, and we want to be a model of Christ-like in their lives. I think that endurance through struggles and pain can radically change a person's perspective of life and what really matters. When I look back at my life, my growth times have been often my struggle times, not my happy celebratory times. And maybe you could identify with that. Psychologist Jonathan Haid said this, or believes these, these uh, three points that he wants to share. People who endure and get through develop more resilience, develop greater Bonding through the experience which can form strong, lifelong relationships. And I know for myself, some of my long-term relationships have come through uh, mine or other people's struggles. And these painful and difficult experiences changes people's priorities and belief systems. And I think many of you can testify, uh, testify that here today, that through some of those really difficult times you've had in your life, it's changed your priorities and the things that are most important in your life and your belief system. It's interesting to note that our freedom and our comfort really lead us to cultivate these benefits in our lives. And that brings us to our concluding thoughts here on what does all this do? What's it for? And it's to glorify God. In 1 Corinthians 10, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. The Bible seems to be very clear that the ultimate purpose in life and also in death is to glorify God. Something else that Paul said, I'm going to share what Paul said and what Peter said and then what James said on this matter. Paul said in, in Romans 8, 17 and 18, Now if we are God's children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, 
If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will reveal will be revealed in us. What does Peter say? 1 Peter 4. Dear friends, don't be surprised by the fiery trials that are going, you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. For these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. And thirdly, what does James say? James, the half-brother of Jesus, said in James 5, As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. And before we, we finish our, this part of the service, I'm going to pray. And just to explain, I'm going to pray. Um, I, I've moved, I haven't changed the meaning of, of Romans 8 from verse 31, but I want to pray that prayer for each of us um, that uh, nothing can separate us from God's love. But before I do, I also want to just announce the fact that we've got a Q&A after the service in the chapel, about 15 minutes after the service finishes. And uh, Wendy Cheatham and Kenny Hobbins are going to join with me. And for any of you who want to come to that Q&A, uh, please come and we can talk through some of these things or anything else that's on your mind about this subject. So let me pray. And uh, as I said, we're going to pray from, uh, from Paul's uh, letter to the church at Rome from chapter 8. Let's bow your heads with me, please. Dear God, with you... On our side, how can we lose? You didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition and exposing yourself to the worst by sending your own son into our place so that you would greatly and freely do this for us. And who would dare tangle with you, dear God? by messing with one of us, your chosen ones? Who would dare even to point a finger? Your son who died for us on the cross, who was raised to life for us, is in your presence at this very moment, sticking up for us. I don't think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between you and us because of Christ's love for us. There is no way, not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins listed in Scripture can separate us. None of this phases us because you and your Son love us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living nor dead, angelic uh, nor demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and your amazing love, dear God, because of the way that Jesus, our Master, has embraced us. And because of these truths, we know that you are always with us. Thank you for these promises. And we pray them in the name of Jesus, your Son and our Lord and Saviour. Amen.